Amen. Acts chapter 16. So there's a lot uh, going on here in Acts chapter 16. We're only going to get through 10 verses um, tonight. We're not going to go um, into the entire um, story. We'll study that um, next week and the, the following sermons. But I want to look at um, especially a new character that's introduced here in Acts chapter 16. Um, we're looking at the beginning of the second missionary journey of Paul. Of course, we, we saw that there was a big argument on who should go on, on what missionary journey, and Paul didn't want Mark to come with him, and Barnabas and him got in an argument. They went their separate ways. Um, we looked at that last week, but now Paul and Silas, um, Paul decided to take Silas with him, and they went their way um, on this second journey. And as you can see, if you look at your map, um, this journey is quite um, a bit further than the first one. It's probably twice um, the distance, they, I'm sure they were gone for several years here on this missionary journey. So this wasn't like going somewhere for a week or two um, like we do when we go on, on mission trips. Um, this was a long a journey that they went through a lot of things. They went through a lot of places and they went, um, you know, to some new territory here that we'll look at on the beginning of that this evening as well. Look at verse number one of Acts chapter 16. So we're going to go through um, pretty quickly, I'm going to go through the first 10 verses here, um, and then we'll go back and see what we can study about um, some of the characters here that we see. Look at verse number 1. It says, Then he came he to Derb and Lystra. Now, if you look at your map, remember, um, so now he's not going across the sea. He's not going across the Mediterranean Sea. He's actually going a land. He's going across the land to the same cities that he went on his first uh, missionary journey. He ended his missionary journey in Derb and Lystra on the first missionary journey, except he goes across land and he goes back to these places. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess and believed, but his father was a Greek. So here we have um, this, this man, um, Timotheus, or Timothy as he's known in the Bible. He's introduced here for the first time. Paul meets him. Look at verse 2, which was well reported of of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. So here is this, this young man, Timotheus, or Timothy, as we know him from the books of the Bible, and we find some things out about him. We find basically three things about him. Number one, his, his mother was Jewish, but she was saved. She believed on the Lord um, Jesus Christ. She was saved, and his father um, was a Greek. So we can kind of assume, and I'll show you, I'll kind of prove that to you a little further um, in a few minutes into the sermon, but we kind of assume that he, this man, this, this young man had a saved mother and a father that was not a believer that was unsaved, okay? So that's kind of what we can um, take from this so far. Now, point number two is um, interesting. Look at point number two, or, or verse number two, I'm sorry, where it says, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. In verse number three, it says, him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters. So in verse number two, we see that this man, turn to Proverbs chapter 22. We see that Timothy, Timotheus here, he had a good report of the people that were there. So that means that he had a good reputation. People had good things to say about him. If you turn to Proverbs chapter 22, um, look at verse number one. This is something that um, I bring up um, every now and then in sermons, but I don't think this is actually something that I can bring up enough because I, I think people undervalue this personally. Look at Proverbs 22 and verse number one. The Bible says, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. So in verse number two of Acts chapter 16, what we're seeing is kind of a proof of Proverbs chapter 22 and verse number 1. We're seeing that this young man had a good name. He had a good reputation, and because of that, look, Paul didn't know this kid. Paul didn't know this kid. He came there. People had great things to say about him. Paul decided to take him um, with him um, when he went um, sharing, spreading the gospel. So it really benefited Timothy. Now turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. So, of course, Timothy, there's two books in the Bible. If you look at it after Colossians, you have those five T books, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, and then 1 and 2 Timothy, and then Titus. Now, it's interesting because we see what came of Timothy in the Bible because the T books in the Bible, 
are actually called the pastoral epistles, if you've ever heard them called that. And the reason for that is because that's where you will find, you know, advice that Paul is giving to church leaders. He is giving, that's where you will find the qualifications of a pastor. We'll look at a couple of them um, this evening. If you want to go into the ministry, you'll have to meet those qualifications of, you know, first First and Second Timothy and many other places in those tea books is they're the pastoral epistles because Paul is kind of preaching them to these men saying, look, these are the qualifications that you need to have. He's giving Timothy, this young man, advice for leading a church. Are you there in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3? Look at verse number 7 of 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, verse number 7. Let me get there myself. So we're talking about a good name, a good report. Okay, so Timothy, we see, is, he's benefited from people saying good things about him. He had a good reputation, okay? Now, we should, the Bible does teach that is actually as a pastor, it is a qualification of a pastor to actually have a good reputation, to have a good report, it says. Look at verse 7 of 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 7. Moreover, talking about all the different qualifications of a pastor in the verses Previously in the verse after, but we're going to focus on verse 7. Moreover, it says, in addition, that's what that means, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So what the Bible is saying here, it said in Proverbs chapter 22, that a good name is very valuable to you. A good name, and this is something that I've just seen with people. I, I see people just throw their name away over some s stupid thing or some a lie they're going to tell or something they're going to, excuse they're going to make. They'll just take their reputation and they'll throw it away. And the problem with your reputation, with the problem with Proverbs chapter 22 and verse number 1, is it takes a very long time to build a good name, to have a good report. So Timothy, having these people in verse number 2 in this town say all these good things about him, they didn't just meet him yesterday. These people, and the reason that it held weight with Paul, is because it takes a very long time to get a good reputation. That's why Proverbs 22 is saying that it's so valuable. But here's the thing about a good name, a good report, a good reputation. It's very difficult to get. It's actually earned over time. It takes diligence to earn that, but it is very easy to lose. It is very easy to lose. One dishonest moment, one, you know, just, you can throw it away very quickly. And then it would take you even longer to rebuild that reputation. But 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 7 is actually saying that not only is it valuable, as Proverbs 22 says, it's literally a qualification for a pastor. And it says that the pastor, the person that wants to be in the ministry, should have a good reputation of them that are without meaning people outside the church. Should, you should have a good reputation. Now, this isn't to say, now this is kind of like a, uh, you know, there needs to be some disclaimers here. Because there is going to be people in your Christian life that are upset at you, that attack you, don't like you because of what you do in your life, because you're living for the Lord, because you're, you're following God, you're showing your love for God, keeping His commandments. There's going to be people that are just against you for that. But in general, in general, this kind of talking about people that are, most people, folks, are just indifferent to the Bible. Most people out there could just care less what the Bible says, what it doesn't say. What this is talking about is just normal, everyday people. So an example is a man at work. People at work should, you know, you should not just be, because look, we, we're, we're dealing with unsaved people every single day of our lives, especially men that go off and work with people that don't believe the Bible, never read the Bible, no idea what it says. They're just, they're indifferent to the Bible, but you should have a good reputation to those people. That means you should be nice. You should be respectful. You should be someone who's known as a hard worker. Pastor Jimenez used to say this all the time. He said, the Christian, the Christian should be the hardest worker at the company. The boss could, could not even be saved, not even like the Bible, but he should, just, he should just want people from this church working for his company because they're, just, they're so honest, they work so hard, they're so reliable, they have a good report. That is what 
the Christians should be like. You should have a good reputation of them that are without. Okay, this isn't talking about people that you're supposed to just, you know, capitulate to people who are attacking you for your stance on the Bible. That's not what I'm talking about. It's just saying, in general, most people should have a good reputation. You should have a good reputation. You should be nice. Because look, we're right about the Bible. You're right about the Bible. You could go and you could be a real jerk to people about that. You could be just slamming the Bible in people's faces and you could make everyone that you ever met anywhere hate you. Just because you're constantly just pushing everything on them and just like, you, you know, but look, you're right. You're right, but you, look, you, you, there's a nice way to go about things. You can be nice to people, you can be respectful to people, and you know, it's actually a qualification for a pastor, all right? Now that's not, you know, there's going to be tribulation. So that always goes hand in hand. The other side of that coin is there's going to be tribulation, which means people persecuting you for your faith. Okay, that's going to happen. That's going to happen. That's not what this is talking about. So Timothy had this, all right? Timothy had this. Don't dismiss this in your life is the, the little mini sermon before we go on here. Don't dismiss this in your life because Paul didn't know Timothy. He just knew that he had a good report. He had a good name from these people, and that was good enough for him. All right, look at verse number 3. Go back to Acts chapter 16. Go back to Acts chapter 16. Look at verse number 3. Now, Paul does something. Now, him, Paul, would have to go forth with him, and, and he took and circumcised him because of the Jews, which were in those quarters, for they knew, they all knew that his father was a Greek. So, he does this, not to re-preach this, but he does this just so he can get past this cultural issue that these Jews had. They knew his father was a Gentile. He didn't want to deal with this. He's like, you know, to the Jews, I became as a Jew. This is what he's doing here. He's not doing anything for salvation. He's just, you know, trying to just get along with this culture so they can go and be effective preaching to these people. Look at verse number four. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders were at Jerusalem. So they're giving these letters now. Remember all these letters that they wrote about decisions on doctrine, things like this? And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. Now, I want to just explain verse number 6 through verse number 10. I'm um, looking at your map before we go back and talk more about Timothy. But look down at your map. Something very interesting happens in the next four verses. Basically, what you have here is you have God directing them where he wants them to go. Look at verse number 6. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia, the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after it says they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Now, when it says Asia there, what it is talking about is the western side, the, the southwestern corner of Turkey. That's what, um, if you look at what I've been calling Turkey, modern-day Turkey on your map, that southwestern corner at this time was called Asia. So basically what they were doing is they went to Derb, they went to Lystra, they went to Iconium, and then they were kind of taking a turn to the south, just like they did on the first missionary journey, which makes sense, right? They were kind of taking that same path, and God said, I don't want you going there. I don't want you going to Asia. So God kind of steers them north, okay? And after they were come to Mycenae, they assaged to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. So Bithynia is north of Asia. All right, so they're like, okay, we'll go up north. God doesn't want us going south. We'll go north. God says, no. All right, it forbid them not. It suffered them not. And they, passing by Mycenae, came down to Troas. So they went straight across. So basically, God was directing them not to go to Asia, not to go north, but instead go straight across. You say, why? Well, in verse number 9 and verse number 10, God explains to us why. Look at verse number 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night, and there stood a man of Macedonia, and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us called us for to preach the gospel unto them. So they're kind of like, this is why. You know, this is why God was like steering us all over the place here, is he wants us to go across. Look, it's across to Macedonia. If you look at your map, you'll see that Macedonia, where is Macedonia? It's basically Greece. It's Greece. So they're going to cross over 
um, the water. They're going to cross the uh, Aegean Sea and go into Greece. So this is really Paul's first trip to Europe right here. So if you look at a map and if you're, you're familiar with your continents, you basically have you know, the, the, the part that we've been calling Turkey. That's the continent of Asia today. All right? And the continent of Europe begins in Greece here. So Paul, this is the first time that Paul has traveled across to Europe. God wanted the gospel going further west. He wanted it getting into Europe. And that's what we will find out um, when we read the rest of this story. So this is the first time that Paul goes into Europe, all right, which is modern-day Greece, what we're calling Macedonia here today. All right? But look, let's look at some lessons from Timothy. So we see Timotheus um, tonight. Um, he is introduced. We see this character that joins um, Paul here um, because of the reputation that he had, um, because of you know, just his, um, his testimony that he had from these people. If you go back to verse number one, let's look at a very interesting uh, characteristic of Timothy that I want to kind of explore a little bit um, this evening. Look at verse number one. It says, A certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess and believed, but his father was a Greek. Now turn to 2 Timothy chapter number one. So I told you that we know that from this statement, we know that his mother was saved, but you can't really say that like his father wasn't saved. I mean, it kind of seems like they're, they're pushing um, at that, but there's more evidence that that was actually the case, that Timothy was actually raised in a home where his father was not a believer, but his mother was. All right, and we see more evidence of that in 2 Timothy chapter 1. We see evidence that his mother was the spiritual influence on him. All right, look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, look at verse number 2. So Paul is writing this letter to Timothy, and he says to Timothy, My dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. So Paul, I mean, you'll, you'll find in your readings of Paul and his interactions with Timothy, Paul is clearly very fond of Timothy. Paul, um, treat, you know, he acts like, you know, he treats him like his own son. Um, he is very fond of this young man. Look at verse number four. Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. Look at number, verse number five now. When I call into remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee. He's saying, he's saying, I just, I'm, almost, I'm moved to tears when I think about the faith that you have. And look what he says, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice. I am persuaded that in thee also. So here we see, Paul kind of gives a history of where Timothy's great faith came from where he received that influence in his life. And look, it was from his grandmother and then his mother. So Timothy is kind of, you know, look, he, I want to talk tonight about the great influence of a mother. The great influence of a mother. Look, there is a lot of, and you say, why is this important? Because the father's supposed to be the spiritual leader and the father's supposed to, you know, lead the home. But first of all, there's a lot of missing fathers out there today. And this, this story of this young man should give hope to children and especially mothers where maybe there's not a father in the home. Or maybe there's a father in the home, but he's not a spiritual leader in the home. He's not leading spiritually. Maybe there's a mother who is saved and a father who is not. Look, this story gives us hope. This story gives us hope for the next generation. Look, here's the thing. It's not God's plan that the father would not be saved and the mother would be. That is not God's plan. God, but here's the beauty of the Bible. The beauty of the Bible is God teaches you the right way to do things. He teaches you to not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Uh, a young lady should never go out and she should never marry a man that is not saved. Never. She should never do that. But here's the thing. God, you know... God works with us even after we mess up his plan. God works with us, and he works, and he tells, he gives advice in the Bible on, on, a, on a wife, on how to deal with, 
with a husband that's not saved, on how to speak with a pure, pure words and how to just show purity and show spirituality that she might win him to the Lord? Because look, everybody's not going to do everything exactly perfect the right way and people are going to mess up God's plan. My wife married somebody that wasn't saved. Thank God that it, it worked out the way, you know, God directed it to work out, thank God. But the point is, the beauty of the Bible and the depth of God's Word is that God gives us a plan, do it this way. But if we don't do it that way, God always has a plan B and a plan C and a plan D and a plan E for our lives. Look, this is, you know, it's not God's plan that a child would be raised without a father. That's not God's plan. But with Timothy, we see that there's a lot of hope for a child like that. That people that have messed up God's plan, people that have made mistakes um, with God's plan. You know, look, two-parent families are much, I mean, there is so many statistical um, studies out there that have nothing to do with the Bible that will just show you that two-parent families, a child raised in a home with a dad and a mom, is going to be so much more successful in every, every single aspect of his life, no matter what you study, than if he's raised in a single-parent home, either with the dad or the mom. But the point is, and look, here's the thing. This is the biggest issue. You say, you, this is the biggest issue with fornication, by the way. You say, you know, bringing up, you know I, I bring up fornication, and the Bible talks about fornication. Actually, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The biggest issue with fornication is that it messes up God's plan for the family. That's the biggest issue with fornication. You say, well, there's lots of issues with fornication. There's lots of issues with fornication, but the biggest one is it derails God's plan for the family. All right, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at verse number 18. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 18, on fornication, this is why the Bible is so serious about fornication. It says flee fornication. That means get far away from it. It says every man, it, it's, and then it explains, it says it's different. It's different from every other sin. How? Every, man that do, every sin that man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. That's a unique thing about fornication. It'll hurt your body. You know, just think about disease and all these different types of things. It's literally unhealthy for you. You're literally destroying your own body is what the, the Bible is saying here. But back to the point. The biggest issue, I mean, if you would ask me, like, what's the main sin that is destroying America? I mean, I think I would probably pick fornication. That, that's the one I would choose. You say, what about, like, homosexuality and perversion and all this unnaturalness and, and nobody even knows what a woman is or a man is. Look, yeah, that's all terrible wickedness, but honestly, that's not something we're going to deal with here because it's just not going to be here. Fornication is, is this universally accepted sin today, and it's destroying the family. Look, even secular science knows this, that fornication is destroying the family. Guess what? I mean, I look up these stats once a year, at least, so I can see the trend. But the trend, the trend for people that, that fornic I mean, I'm talking about having physical relationships with the opposite sex outside of marriage. The trend is relatively flat as far as who's, you know, in fornication, the percentage of people in fornication, because it's pretty much everybody. It's like 95%. And it's pretty much flat. It's like 95% of people are committing fornication before they get married. It's, it's pretty much flat. It's nearly universally accepted. This is a major problem in our country today. This is the problem with the family. This is destroying families. Let me explain to you why. And look, it, it's, here's another thing. It's the same. Here's another reason that it's, that it's so bad in our country. Because everyone complains about California. Oh, California is so liberal. And, you know, people in the Midwest, oh, we're so much better. Look, it's the same there. It's the same. These stats are the same there. Why? Because everyone's watching the same Hollywood, everyone's watching the same movies, everyone's watching the same TV shows, everyone's being programmed by the same media, by the same garbage, by the same internet, everyone's bringing in the same stuff and they're all doing the same things. Is that surprising? It's not. So the point is, it's the same garbage everywhere. The fornic fornication is, is almost universally accepted in our country today. I don't care what state you live in. But here's what is changing. 
Here's what is changing though, and I'm going to show you just I'm going to show you a secular study that is so interesting on how this is destroying the family and it's creating single parent households in in this country. Let me just this is this is not the Bible. This is like science figuring this out. You don't you love it when science catches up with the Bible? You know, the Bible's been saying this for, I don't know, thousands of years. And here's some scientist, you know, in 2020, he's like, I figured out a trend. The Bible's been saying this for thousands of years. Let me just give you an example of a study that was just done, okay? Here's what's changing. Fornication is not changing. The amount of people that fornicate is not changing. It's, it's pretty much 95%. It's pretty much, pretty much everybody, all right? Not us. Not our kids. But pretty much everybody out there, all right? Look. Here's what's changing, though. The amount of fornication is changing. And, and I'll try to keep this as, as, as uh, professional as I can from, from the pulpit here, but basically the amount of people that, that, you, that people fornicate with is, is growing before they do get married. Okay, so two things are changing. The amount of fornication between, before marriage is changing is rising. And the second thing that's changing is marriage is happening later and later and later. Every year I check this, it gets later and later. There has never been a time in the history of the United States where the average male and female age of marriage has been higher than today. In 2022, that age, think about this for a second. Think about this as a woman who would want to have children. The average age for marriage in the United States is 34 years old at this point. I mean, when I started the satellite, I remember it was 30. It's rising that fast. It's never been higher than that, okay? But here's what they found in 2021, this study that I'm going to kind of quote some numbers from. They found that the more fornication that happens before marriage, the greater the odds of divorce. And the numbers will shock you. The numbers will actually shock you. First of all, let me just give you a, a couple numbers on the amount of fornication and how that is increasing. Okay, in the, 19, in the 1970s, and, they, and, and it's funny because the person that did this study, they said we had to use women, we had to, all these, these stats are from women. They said we had to use women because men aren't honest about these things. <laughs> I had to laugh. You know, men will just lie about these things, you know. So basically they're asking women this. In the 1970s, women, women that had fornicated with more than 10 people before they got married was 2% of women. Like, almost nobody did that, right? I mean, that's, almost no one did that. In the 2010s, like after 2010, that number went to almost 20%. So like one in five, one in five women has, before they get married, they fornicated with more than 10 people, all right? Now the measure of a successful marriage in this, uh, a successful marriage that did not end in divorce, the measure is being, being married more than five years. Right? Like, you should be able to be married more than five years, like, on accident, okay? If you have any, like, staying power or morality at all, okay? But the point is, more than five years and you're not on this list, okay? So we see that in the 1970s, it was 2%. In the, after 2010, it was almost 20%, okay? Now look, 6% of the people, this, let me see, let's see here. Pure marriages where there was no fornication. Pure marriages where there was no fornication in the latest study that they did after 2000, only 6% of them ended before five years. So that's a successful marriage, 6%. Okay, now if you look at those, those women that fornicated with more than 10 people, like that, the worst case scenario, I guess, is what we would call it in this study, that number of marriages that fail before five years is 33%. This is, this is just a secular study. I mean, this, this is a person that's saying, we found a correlation here. You know, we found a correlation of, and now, they'll, they'll, now what they'll do is if you keep reading these studies, they'll just draw all the wrong conclusions. <laughs> they'll, come to, they'll, they'll get the numbers right of what the Bible says is going to happen and what the Bible says you should do and shouldn't do. They'll get the numbers right. They'll get the trends right. But then they'll draw all the wrong conclusions about this. They'll say, oh, it's a societal problem on the way society views women or something, you know, stupid like that. But the point is, if you look at a woman who is, who is pure, who went into marriage 
pure and, and put off fornication before she got into marriage. I mean, the obvious answer on why she's not getting divorced is because that is a woman that values and heeds the Word of God. That is a woman who takes the Bible seriously. That is a woman who has already denied herself for what the Bible says. That I should, the Bible says I should do this. Even though my flesh wants to do this, I'm going to listen to what the Bible says. So the Bible is also very against divorce. God hates divorce. God hateth putting away, the Bible says. So she will also listen to that. So that's not like, I mean, look, feminism itself, feminism is the cause of this. Feminism is, it destroys women, it destroys marriages, it, just, it literally destroys women's lives. This idea of feminism saying, hey, don't get married until you're 34 years old and go fornicate so when you do get married, you'll have a failed marriage. I mean, it's, it's the worst thing that has ever happened to women. Like, and, then, and then you get divorced. Think about it, and I'm not trying to beat up anybody that's been divorced. Look, that is a, I, I have friends that have been divorced. It's a terrible thing. It's like the worst thing that could happen. I mean, I have a friend that got divorced, and it's like the, it just, it completely devastated his life. I mean, imagine being married to somebody that you thought, thought you were going to be married to for the rest of your life, and for what, one reason or another, you end up divorced, and you spent maybe 10, 15 years, 20 years with that person. Look, it, it's, it's devastating to the people it, that it happens to, and it's, it's even more devastating to the kids in the situation. It literally destroys lives, divorce does. And what does it all stem from? It all stems from fornication. Fornication is destroying the family unit. It's destroying God's plan. God has this plan of a man and a woman, and he's the spiritual leader, and she's also supposed to be spiritual. And look, the kids, I mean, how could the kids fail? It's like this fail-safe plan that God has. And we even see in the case of Timothy, you take away the dad, and the mom takes her role seriously. Look at Timothy. He became this great pastor, this great spiritual leader, because of his mother. Let's go back to Timothy. Look, I, I beat the guys in this church over the head about being proper spiritual leaders. But God always has a plan B. God always has a plan B. Well, women are not to be the leaders in the family, and they're not to be the leaders in the church. They have great influence to step in and fulfill this role when a faithful man cannot be found. And this is what we see in Timothy. So let's look at the, the value of a mother's influence through him. Turn to Proverbs chapter 1. Just think about a mother's influence. Think about a grandmother's influence. Think about an aunt's influence. If you're an aunt, a grandmother, a mother, look, just think you could have great influence over children that are yours, children that you have influence over. Just you can pass this faith on to them. This cannot be overstated. It is always better to have two parents that are faithful and strong leadership of a husband, but God always has a plan B. Even after we mess up the marriages, we mess up the families. God doesn't, you know why he does it though? Because God values the next generation. God wants the next generation, the next generation, why? You say, why? Because Christianity and the gospel, it depends on the next generation. It's, it's like, it's how it works. It's how Christianity works. Look at Proverbs chapter 1, verse number 8. The Bible says, my, my son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the what? The law of thy mother. Proverbs 6, says a very similar thing. It says, my son, keep thy father's commandments and forsake not the law of thy mother. Look, that's double protection right there. But the mother, look, the Bible here is saying that she, the mother, is the lawgiver. In Deuteronomy 6, when the Bible is saying, you know, we talked about being keepers at home, what are you doing? You're, you're speaking the law to your children as they rise up, as they lie down. She's giving the law to the next generation. She is the law giver. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Look, that, that's a big responsibility right there. To be the lawgiver to the next generation, to be the lawgiver to the children in the home. 2 Timothy 3 says, in verse number 16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Now look what it's, what it's for. It says, for reproof, 
for correction, and guess what? For instruction in righteousness. You know what children need? They need instruction in righteousness. That is the lawgiver right there. That is the mother right there to instruct the Bible in righteousness. Now, guess what? Guess what? Ladies, to give the law, you must know the law. You cannot teach something that you don't know. So even if you have a husband that is spiritual and you have a husband that is doing a good job leading your home, you still have to know the law to give the law to the next generation. You still have to know it. You know, the next generation, turn to Psalm chapter 145. God is extremely concerned about the next generation always. Look at Psalm chapter 145 and uh, verse number 4. I'll read for you Psalm 100, verse number 5, while you're turning there. For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. That's the difference between the Bible and every other book right there. God's truth applies to every generation. There's no other book that's like that. No matter where you live, no matter where you were born, what time you were born, how, what generation, you could have been born 5,000 years ago, you could have been born yesterday. The Bible applies to you the same. There's no other book like that. There's no other book that's been written because God's truth endureth to all generations. It's also a promise that God will keep his word for us, which is why we have the King James Bible here. Look at Psalm 145, verse number 4. Again, Christianity depends on this generational transfer of the law, this generational transfer of God's word. Look at uh, verse number four of Psalm 145. One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. How is the next generation going to know what God has done? Because their parents are going to tell them. And the Bible talks specifically, the mother is going to give the law to the children. Now turn to Proverbs chapter 31, and we see a very specific example of this in the Bible. So look, it is the responsibility of one generation to declare the works of God, to declare the gospel, to declare the law to the next generation. You say, that's an easy one. Look at Proverbs chapter 31. Look at Proverbs chapter 31. So Proverbs are attributed, are attributed to, the, to King Solomon. So King Solomon was, was what? What was he? He was the wisest man that ever lived. I'll read for you uh, 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 29. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding, exceeding much, and largest, largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. So remember, Solomon, as a young man, when he took over the kingdom, he asked God for wisdom, for discernment, to judge the people. And God said, I'm going to make you the wisest because you didn't ask for riches, because you didn't ask me to crush your enemies. He's like, I'm going to make you the wisest. How about this? I'll make you the wisest person that ever lived. But the question is, how did God do that? Here's the question. What was the mechanics of how Solomon became so wise? Remember Paul? When Paul got saved, when Paul got knocked off uh, his, his donkey on the, on the road to Damascus, and Jesus himself took Paul for three years into Arabia. He, Paul was taught by Jesus Christ. That's the mechanics. That's how, you know, Paul wrote most of the New Testament. You're like, how did he get so smart? Because Jesus taught him this stuff. Because Jesus told him. Who taught, how did Solomon get this wisdom? Did God just be like, now you're the wisest man that's ever lived? Look at Proverbs 31. Look at the very first verse. The, Bi the Bible says the words of King Lemuel, that's King Solomon, the prophecy, who taught him? That his mother taught him. So obviously his dad was involved here, but I mean, look, the Bible is saying that the wisest man that has ever lived was taught by his mother. Now here's another one. Here's a lot of, a lot of moms will say, well, I'm just, you know, I, I'm an imperfect person and I'm just going to lean on my husband to just be the spiritual one and Maybe, you know, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life and, and you know, maybe I'm not just going to be able to be this great teacher of the Bible to my children. Who was Solomon's mother? Bathsheba. Was she a perfect woman? She made some pretty major mistakes in her life, wouldn't you say? I mean, Bathsheba, you, I mean, the first, the first time I say that word, you, you think of the adultery with King David and you think of the terrible thing that happened to her husband, Uriah, and you just think about, like, oh, look, 
she's the one that taught Solomon the law of God. She obviously came back from that. All right, so look, God used, at least in part, Solomon's mother to declare his wisdom to him, all right, to convey the wisdom to Solomon. Look, your kids aren't going to learn the Bible by sleeping next to it. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. They don't, they're not going to learn the Bible by having it on the bookshelf in the house. You know, the children are going to learn the Bible by you first reading it to them, explaining it to them. It's just like soul winning. You know, I mean, the Bible is not the simplest thing to understand, especially for children, but it's just going to take a lot of time reading to them, explaining to them. What do we do at the door? We read a verse, we explain a verse. So we read to our children. We explain to our children. Pretty soon, they start reading on their own. You know, I don't have to sit with Garrett at night and help him read his Bible anymore. <laughs> you know, it's just, they, they, they start to walk on their own. But look, it takes a lot of time to do that. So look, the point I'm trying to get you to understand tonight is that God's design is perfect. It's powerful. It's, it's protection for the next generation. It's a fail-safe to have these, this, this spiritual leader of a father and then this mother as well. But Timothy is a perfect example of this fail-safe plan working where he didn't have that spiritual father. But instead, his mother still taught him. And she still she imparted this great faith on him. So ladies, mothers, grandmothers, aunts, great aunts, do not ever downgrade your influence that you have over, what, the next generation. Say, what kind of influence? Maybe there's a, a child that I, I only see twice a year. You could still be a great influence when you see them that, those two times a year. You know, but you have to, you know, you have to have, you know, that, that knowledge, that, that faith in you. Because it doesn't just happen just by osmosis. All right, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So Timothy, Timothy, just give me, let me just give you two quick points um, to just close up on Timothy here. First of all, we need to find Timothy's. You know, every, every church, every, every mission, every, every, every ministry needs Timothy's. And you never know, you know, you know, when we go out and we knock doors and we get people saved, look, this, this kid, Timothy, he wasn't saved for that long. A few months. A few months because he got saved through Paul's first missionary journey. And it was his, his mother's faith that, that got him saved. And then it was just the reputation that he had, his character, you know, that, that matched up with his faith, where he turned into this person. He got saved and he just wanted to get to work right away. So look, we need to find Timothy's. But here's the next thing I want to say. You never know. You never know because look, Paul, when he walked into Lystra and Derb, he didn't know this kid from, from Adam. So that's a, the last point I want to make, is you, you are never going to know your full influence that you have had on this world until you get to heaven. You are never going to know, you know, if you get somebody saved and then they get somebody else saved and then they go off to be, you know, some great soldier for Christ somewhere. You're never going to know, fully know, your complete influence until you get to heaven. Because Paul, he didn't even know Timothy until he came through the second time. He didn't even know that this seed that he planted in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 6, Paul says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but what? God gave the increase. This is another thing we need to realize that, you know, you're just not going to know when you go and you talk to somebody about the Bible, maybe, that, maybe it's just a bridge too far for them to cross at that time. But take that time if they're willing to listen, preach them what the Bible is, answer their questions on what they have, you know, about questions they have, contradictions that they think about in their head. Try to answer their questions and just plant as many seeds as you possibly can. Because when you get to heaven, you're going to realize that a lot of those seeds were watered by somebody else and God was giving the increase the whole way. And we just never know when we're going to find Timothy's like this. We never know when a seed planted that maybe isn't a salvation right at that moment turns into something like this, something great. Okay, so Timothy, a great man in the Bible, just turns out to be just this great pastor 
in the Bible, two books um, of the Bible, and Paul wrote letters to um, Timothy. Um, just, but just a great example of just how his mother had this great influence over him. So I yell a lot at the guys uh, about being that spiritual leader, but uh, mothers, you have a huge responsibility, and you can have a huge effect on the next generation. It's literally um, God's fail-safe plan um, for these kids. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.